I will show you to conclude what you can do by applying this concept in the insula and showing you movies, uh, I mean, uh, the technical issues. I don't like so much, uh, finally, I'm not so skilled. I mean, uh, never I had any problem with uh, the Sylvian arteries. I touch wood, but if you do subialdization, you do not coagulate in the brain. Uh, finally, nothing more or less will happen. So surgery for insula diffuse le greg lyoma. Why I would prefer a transopercular approach according to this parting. First of all, because this tumor is very frequently within the paralympic system, but maybe it's a bias of recruitment. Second, because uh, the anatomy is complex, the anatomy, the anatomy, I will not insist about uh, the connections between the paralympic system, the cortical anatomy, but also the Y matter tract. And uh, you know that uh, uh, it's a, uh, um, a little bit special regarding the keto architectony because it's a mesocortex. So functional issues also so important in the insula. And nonetheless, you know that if you remove the insula, the patient will recover. If you preserve the connectivity, why? Because bilateral system and the compensation thanks to the contralateral hemisphere. So the goal is the same. If you can remove the tumor earlier, it's better. And it's better, better, because most of the time in these cases, they have intractable seizures. So you improve the quality of life of the patient too. Once again, do your psychological assessment. Now you have understood the principle. Uh, it's not possible. Of course it is. When I went to Montpellier from Paris, uh, there were no neuropsychologists, a speech therapist, and so on. And finally, everything is possible. You have to ask, because you demonstrated that it was important for the patient. So it's our job also to be a manager, a leader by telling, I want to have this possibility for the patients. Definitely to know the why matter tract, because this is the limitation of neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm too much invasion of the I4 of the optic tract posteriorly, of the ILF, uh, of the arcuate fascicle posteriorly, mm, the anterior part of the stratum sagittal in the left hemisphere. Mm, no way. I will not remove the tumor. I will not be efficient. In this case, just biopsy. And then chemotherapy by crossing fingers. And not radiotherapy to radiate the convergence of five pathways. It's not dangerous. No, of course. Brain anatomy is crucial. You have to perform dissection by yourself. And DTI also, didactic tool. Do the dissection by yourself. Do the Klingler. Identify by yourself the cortical termination. And what will happen? You will be into the OR with the intraoperative mapping, monitoring, and so on. You have understood with everything in your mental imagery, and you don't need any more the robot and your navigation, and so on, and so on. Because it all cases, you will push the realization according to functional boundaries because it's a diffuse tumor. So when the patient will tell you, stop, and when it will be in agreement with what you know, the limitation of brain plasticity, what are you going to do? To remove more? To induce a permanent deficit voluntarily? Why do you know that in all cases you will not cure the patient? So transopercular approach, why? Technically speaking, because Mitch reported that if you remove the operculum, you will have a better exposure. It's just an evidence. Rather than to put the retractor, you know, and to say, oh, I'm a good neurosurgeon, I'm mm, mm, preserve the brain. Ah, now I can see better. Okay. You have a possibility, which is to remove the non-eloquent part of the brain of this patient at that time, because a networking brain, and by doing a mapping, including in the so-called non-dominant hemisphere. Because you do a subpial decision, never, never I split it in the uh, Sylvian fissure for 10 years. The rate of ischemic problem, zero. The rate of spasm is zero. The MD Anderson came. And finally, at noon, surgery was finished, and they said, how it was possible to go so fast? Because I removed the brain. Because it's a brain tumor. I will not deal with uh, the vessels. I'm not really a surgeon. I'm afraid by the vessels. Why well, transopercular approach? Because most of the time, <laughs> this tumor are involving also the operculum. So you imagine, I will open the sylvan fissure in order to remove the insula, and finally, at the end, I will remove the operculum. Uh, Maybe if you remove the operculum since the beginning, it will be easier. No. 
because the morbidity is, redu is reduced. 5 to 10 percent of severe permanent deficit by the best surgeon than me in the literature, less than 1 percent in my experience. Definitely, I'm not so skilled. But I know where I am when I am into the brain. And because you can learn to do that, of course you can use neural navigation as a didactic tool outside the operating theater by doing the decision by yourself. And it's so easy to remove the operculum. And then you will add the function. And then you will go to the OR, awake mapping, to map the operculum, to map the fibers in the depth. And of course, you have to know that SLF is absolutely crucial at the level of the dorsal pathway. The uh, ventral semantic pathway also involved in uh, uh, the uh, semantic association task, uh, and so on and so on. And the mentalizing, if you want or not. But it's strange. In 70% today of my patients, when they come to my consultation, they are telling, are you going to change my personality? I don't push them to say that. I know that in US, they are not telling that. But in France, yes. So you have to adapt. So yes, it's possible to ask. Uh, we did that uh, uh, past week. Uh, uh, patient uh, stimulated uh, the ventral semantic pathway, and she said suddenly, oh, I'm not able to recognize uh, the emotion expressed by this face. And of course, I stopped, and my patients are not depressed anymore, as I told you. The bimanual coordination also. I operated on many surgeons, probably a bias of recruitment in my series. And what they are telling, of course, I am here because I know you will propose to remove the tumor. I agree with that. Is it possible for me to consider to be a surgeon following your surgical act? In 100% cases, they were able to return to the operating theater with good results. When I meet them, I have the habit not to ask, who are you, but how are your patients? And of course, it's very important also to preserve uh, the motor control. And you should know that there is a network specifically involved in the control of the motor network, the control. So you can map uh, the bimanual coordination into the OR. You can map the attentional processing also. Yes, it's possible. You can map, uh, so as we say, the language. Uh, we can map the semantic processing, including in the right non-dominant hemisphere. We spoke about that. You see, everything is now an evidence, but applied to this specific case when you are into the paralympic system, even in the so-called right non-dominant hemisphere. And uh, um, I will not insist about uh, the metacognition, but more and more we are also asking to the patient if he's aware about the fact that he lost uh, sometimes uh, the possibility to, be, uh, um, to give the good answer. In other words, the consciousness about the fact that you know what you know. Well, it's just science. No, it's exactly the proper of human being, beyond the fact that you are hemiplegic or not. A dancer? Transparietal approach. Why sometimes transparietal approach? Because a very posterior location of uh, the uh, insula, you know, probably the diagram by uh, uh, Mitch uh, and Nader, and by telling posteriorly and uh, upper limb, sometimes uh, it's very difficult to have an access. So you can go through the supramarginal gyrus and not just through the frontal operculum. Otherwise, it's too posterior. And then you will leave the tumor and then no impact. If you just have to remove 30% uh, of the tumor, don't go to the OR. And at the end, finally, the sensory motor pathways. It happened to me uh, two weeks ago. The patient was awake uh, in the right non-dominant hemisphere. And what I have induced when I stimulated, of course, not a movement, but somatosensory reactions. The patient said, mm, I felt mm, almost pain. OK, I know. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it was the end because I am into the contact of the somatosensory thalamocortical pathway, which is the lateral part of the internal capsule in the posterior limb. It's so evident. How do you want to have this kind of so subtle information, subtle information, if the patient is under general anesthesia? I will not speak about the clostrum, but just uh, the uh, lateral part of uh, the lentiform nucleus, the deep gray nuclei at the end. And uh, you should know that when you stimulate uh, the lateral part, uh, you will induce just the lateral part because we did the uh, resection of the insula, you will induce articulat uh, articulatory disorders. So you know where you are. And sometimes it could be very provocative because in this case we accepted 
to have uh, attentional processing disorders, except the fact that the patients had 10 seizures a day despite four antiepileptic drugs, no seizures anymore, and finally the quality of life improved of the patient. Of course, it's not hemiplegic because you can imagine the pathways here, but he had attentional cognitive deficit. But he had before related to seizures and uh, antiepileptic drugs. So you see, it's a balance, but uh, I don't like to have these cases, of course. And the question is why to wait so much before to refer the patient to the near surgeon? So the result. Almost uh, 200, so in fact, patients more now, but I stopped uh, uh, this uh, series uh, uh, three years ago. I will not insist about the fact that they are young with uh, uh, very frequently intractable seizures, and uh, uh, that, uh, in my experience, probably a bias, but so few, in fact, pure insular log regulator. In 80% of cases, they are already involving the operculae, so paralambic. Initially, I did uh, some patients under general anesthesia when I was younger, and I induced modification of the behavior. My patients were, I were irritable, modification of the personality, depressed, and so on, and so on. I said, okay, now I understood, I stopped, because it was in the so-called right non dominant hemisphere. No spasm. I will not insist on the fact that many of my patients, of course, you know that, will have a transitory, but sometimes very impressive, a postoperative deficit, whatever the location. So explaining why the postoperative cognitive uh, and or functional physiotherapy uh, rehabilitation is already planned before to go to the OR. 98% of positive functional results, less than 1%, 1.5% of permanent deficit today. Median extent stabilization, 93%. It's not related, you will see that, uh, to uh, the volume of the tumor. 81% of patients in N-girl class 1, so once again, uh, like in the uh, wool series, finally you have more or less 80% of cases uh, uh, which uh, uh, will benefit uh, from uh, 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 relief of seizures in case of preoperative intractable seizures. As I said previously, you can remove sometimes the major temporal structures, okay? And uh, the extent of resection is strangely, maybe not directly related to the volume of the tumor. But now you have understood why. Because if you have uh, a small but objective residue, because involvement of the deep connectivity, even if the tumor is very big above this connectivity or very small, you will leave the connectome intact. You have to in all cases, otherwise the patient will have a permanent deficit. So my nightmare, the anterior perforating substance, so I prefer to leave it, definitely, but uh, now I have understood, as I say, that because the anatomy, it's crazy. I did not imagine that 20 years ago. I was uh, so poor. Temporal stem with the eye of insula, the main insula, anterior perforating substance. You have no risk, in fact, because if you are into the contact of the perforating arteries, that means that you cut the eye off. So your patient is not well anymore. So you have to stop according to the functional boundaries. And then, of course, you will live into the anterior perforating substance, or not if you accept to have 10% of permanent deficit. I cannot, but I say that to the patients. Strange, because never they ask me to be hemiplegic. It is strange. Solution, maybe, so to go through the supramarginal gy gyrus in the posterior part, as I told you, and to operate, reoperate, re reoperate, and so on. It's true also in the insula, especially if no radiotherapy. Otherwise, you can imagine the nightmare to do a subpial dissection regarding a third surgery into the insula uh, with uh, a radiotherapy before. <laughs> Avoid that. Or, once again, if you accept 10% of permanent deficit. 85% of my patients are still alive in this location, too. And uh, 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 finally, I would say that to operate the insula is much more uh, as uh, uh, to operate uh, another location in the, the brain, uh, mm, except the fact that the rate of supratotal removal is, of course, lesser. So, if you know the anatomy, if you know the limitation of plasticity, then suddenly you will see that it's very easy to remove the insula. And I said, really easy. My chief resident at the end of their residencies are able to do that without me. It's reliable, it's reproducible. 
Case illustration, just five minutes if you want to see 32 year old female, a medical doctor, resident, no previous medical history, incidental discovery. I love these cases, of course, because uh, she was not asymptomatic. We did a neuropsychological examination and she had some disorders. But no one would like to operate her because it's too big, because uh, uh, she's too young, because uh, she's too asymptomatic, because blah, blah. Okay. So I don't know if it will work. It works. Just five minutes movies, and you will see the postoperative MRI. So to comment, I prefer to have a larger bone flap. Why to have a positive mapping? It seems uh, that uh, uh, we are better surgeon if we have a small bone flap. I have asked uh, to my patients, even uh, 20 years after, and they told me, no, it's not really an issue because I do not shave. So you can see nothing in the hair. The rate of infection, in my experience, uh, is 0.7% without shaving. So you suffer. You suffer for the closure. We have to accept that. Cortical mapping, the patient is awake, lateral position. I have a poor mental imagery. In fact, I have two positions for the brain, left, right. That's it. And through the skin, I can really see the inferior frontal occipital fascicle, for instance. Here, you can see it, um, maybe. This is the most important. In fact, the cortical surface, we know. You can imagine that it was the ventral premolar cortex uh, and on that uh, we had a complete blocking at this level. You can see the SLF3 uh, uh, between the ventral premolar cortex and the supramarginal gyrus. We have the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, with an involvement in semantic uh, uh, processing. So the IFOF is there for the cortical termination at the level of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And we will have some termination at the level of the prefrontal frontopolar cortex. But here, it's just the so-called broker's area. You don't care, the patient is, aware, is, is awake uh, uh, and will help you to do without microscope uh, because otherwise uh, I will not imagine uh, anymore due to my poor mental imagery, uh, the fasciculi in the depth. You can do very easily. A subpial dissection, never, never, never. I will try to open uh, this field beyond Fisher and the rate uh, uh, related to in my experience, and I'm not so skilled to a problem at the level of the Sylvian uh, Fisher was zero once again. So if I can do that, really, you can do that. You see, it's very easy. And finally, you remove uh, more or less uh, monoblock uh, the uh, pars uh, opercularis to have uh, a very good uh, triangularis and orbitaris, so the inferior frontal gyrus, the inferior frontal sulcus is there, in order to have a good access uh, to the insula and to remove the insular part by doing a subpial dissection. By uh, you will lift up the uh, um, superior insular sulcus. So you can do that. Uh, you see, it's more or less uh, uh, real time. I mean, uh, you need uh, two hours to do this kind of surgery. I mean, it's not incompatible with a normal activity of a departmental neurosurgery. If they want to uh, do a lumbar disc uh, uh, after your surgery, you will not be uh, uh, from 7 in the morning to 8 p.m. And now, so you can see that I will take the retractor, not to retract the brain itself, but in fact uh, to lift up the insula. And now I am into the insula. Here you have the piamata, all the vessels. Never I will be into the contact. No, no bleeding. I mean, a little bit vain, but never I coagulate it, except the cortical surface after the negative mapping. Never I will coagulate. In all cases, I have the hemostasis, because you remove the tumor according to functional boundaries, but also the subpial dissection. And functional boundaries, once again, the risk is now. You are into the contact of the temporal stem. You have to stimulate, and you will hear the magic word, semantic disorders. Okay, I know where I am. But maybe there is a residue at this level, and so what? I will cut the life off. I will use a permanent deficit to this young girl. Um, no one would like to operate her. Remember, so now I have to be reasonable, and maybe to do 99% of the patient because I will not cure her, but to avoid chemo, radiotherapy, and so on, and to avoid malignant transformation. So now you have understood, we are into the contact of the minimal common brain, the connectome, the white matter tract, the IFO, the temporal stem. You should see that. Never the robot will tell you that. 
Because it doesn't know. Because you need the cognitive monitoring. You will have, okay, just a, a smaller temporal decision too in order uh, to run uh, uh, under the insula. Okay. The most important so the subcortical stimulation. Of course, uh, we have no sound, uh, we have no time also because it will be just uh, the end of uh, the hour I had. So what I would like uh, uh, to show you is that uh, you can finish the resection at this level because you disconnected this part of the, uh, uh, the lobe, so no functional anymore. So you have the habit to put patient under general anesthesia with good anesthesiologist and they put a tube. Uh, final hemostasis, never I coagulate it, never I coagulate it. And then this is the postoperative MRI. The patient was able to return as a mm, normal, uh, um, uh, with a normal personality, I mean, uh, because uh, she's a psychiatrist. And she was able to manage a patient three months following surgery, working full time with no antiepileptic drugs uh, because uh, no seizures before, no chemotherapy, no radiotherapy, of course, despite the fact that there was a focus of glioblastoma in the middle of the tumor. And strangely, because it was medical, she is a medical doctor, some young colleagues, very famous, told me, we will not do a radiotherapy in this poor year, a young girl. Oh, really? I thought that in the past meeting, you told in front of everyone, we have to irradiate by applying the protocol. Yes, but you understand, in this case, it's a little bit different. Okay, personalized medicine. So you have definitely to make a decision now if you want to treat a glioma. And to my opinion, there is no interest as a neurosurgeon. It's better to become a molecular biologist or to take care of your patients. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luke, for this uh, highly exciting, very, very impressive um, presentation. And the message you um, gave to all of us is very clear. Um, yeah, we should stick to neurosurgery. Okay, are there any questions? Thank you very much for your talk. I'm Julian from Singapore. Um, so all the patients they've had for low-grade gliomas are the young ones, and generally they're, they come to you because they're very willing to go through surgery, and then they probably already know that they may need awake surgery as well. What would be your most difficult patient when, um, when you need to perform awake surgery? For example, patients with highly, anxiety, highly, ang um, highly anxious patients or patients who you know, cannot bear the thought of a weak surgery, what would be your most difficult patient? Nonetheless, I have 15, one five percent of my patients coming from the area of Montpellier. In other words, uh, it's a good control group. You're totally right. I mean, they did not decide to come specifically to meet me. I'm just there. Sometimes it's much more complex, but never it was impossible. Because nonetheless, I explained. Then the neuropsychologists explain, and so on and so on. And they have time to discuss. And they will go to internet by telling uh, uh, this tumor is very aggressive. So maybe it's better to be operated on or not. It depends on their philosophy. I don't speak about incidental discovery. I speak about patients with seizures. And finally, even patients who decided uh, to be waited, to, to wait initially to be uh, uh, watched, they will have seizures. And they will come back. They will say, uh, uh, what about the new MRI? To your opinion, the tumor go, yes, I imagine. So finally, please operate me because I have understood. And because I'm so afraid, because they're anxious by the tumor itself, because what they want is to live longer and better. So finally, not worry about that. If you explain, if you take time, if you have a good team, the patient will finish to find his own solution. And I had, in my experience, less than 0.5% of patients who said, I cannot. No, 
my colleagues can do a biopsy and we do a chemo radiotherapy in this one percent of patients, we will say, but it's so exceptional. Mm -hmm. If you take time, I mean, sometimes they are coming also because, uh, uh, okay, they know uh, through internet or their colleagues and say, uh, go to Montpellier, but uh, they could be reluctant. And so frequently it happened pa past week. The patient arrived and said, uh, finally, I come because my wife insisted I didn't want to be operated on. After two hours, he said, uh, I would like to be operated on next week. No, I'm sorry, I cannot next week. It will be next month. And I want for you to have time to think, to digest what I say today. Never I will do that very um, um, quickly, except in some, okay, glioblastoma, but um, we are not speaking about that today. I, I just wanted to second your comment about not shaving for craniotomies. Yeah. I've been doing that for 20 years, just part the skin. And usually you can make an incision following the vasculature of the scalp, so there's very little bleeding staple and no dressing. Uh, if you don't traumatize the skin by shaving, it doesn't tend to bleed in my experience. Is that yours? Mm, probably, to be honest. Uh, uh, outside the brain, I'm not the best to answer these kind of questions. I mean, why I decided to stop to shave? Because initially, I had uh, just a small shave, and when you put uh, a field, um, I had the habit uh, to uh, do my uh, score in the hair nonetheless. And one day I decided to stop <coughs> because the reasons were not uh, so bad. And now it's really uh, the protocol, if I can say, I have no protocol except to avoid to shave. And to be honest, never I had any problem with the scalp except in one patient. And of course, this patient was irradiated before surgery. Yes, we would like to thank you again, Uke, for this uh, outstanding presentation. Thank you. Thank you.